No, 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 we're not. You guys want to, so you'll do that every other week, and then you'll start that movie up again, and then so you can kind of go see a progress. But all right, everybody. <laughs> All right, Eli. Yeah. Let's get started. Uh, that's all right. All right. So, so why do we have laws? Why, why can somebody tell me we have laws? To what are they? Safe. Keep people safe. Good. What else? Well, why else do we have laws? Why do we have law? Okay, let me let me caveat that. Why do we have laws and punishments? What do they do? Oh, they just make sure you don't. So it's a preventative measure, right? So what, well, let's say, what do you get, what happens if you steal something? What happens? You go to jail, right? You, get, you pay a fine, you go to jail, you have to get the stuff back, right? What happens if you uh, commit adultery? It's not really, it's, that's, that's not really a, a fine, but you go into a divorce, there's a long process, there's a legal process, so there's, there's like steps to go through everything, right? What happens if you go and uh, kill somebody? You either get life in prison or you get the death sentence, right? Or, or, you know, you don't get life in prison, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. So, so as you can see, so laws, right? They're, they have their, they have meaning. They're meant to prevent crime and things from happening, right? So what we're going to look at today um, for a little bit is we're going to look at some of the first, this is one of the first systems of law, the first code of law at that. There's about 282 of them. We're not going to go through all of them. Don't worry. That'd be way too long. Um, I've never actually gone through all these. I probably will later, but because I like this type of stuff for some reason. Um, but it's just interesting. You'll kind of see some differences from what we think is culturally acceptable and what they thought is culturally acceptable. All right. All right. Can uh, somebody read number two for me? If anyone Interesting, right? Can you put that in like more actual understandable terms uh, by any chance? No, 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 like you did a good job. I'm just saying, could you put that into like, modern English? Hmm? Okay, so false accusation, we're getting there. So let's, I'll give you an example. So let's say um, I say, I go to uh, Coach Vosberg. I tell him, you know what? You, uh, you stole my daughter from me. I'm very upset you stole my daughter from me. And he's like, well, I want trial by Whipper, which is weird, right? You guys know that, like, well, I'll get into that in a second. So the whole idea of trial by Whipper is it's like a religious ceremony um, that the gods are going to judge you. So if you sink, you're guilty, and you'll get the property or whatever it was, right? So you get all the property because it's, it's an honor code. Somebody's uh, disrespecting you. They're, um, um, or you float because you know how to swim, right? Because not everybody back then knew how to swim, which is funny because they all live on rivers. But so either you sunk or you swim, right? And that's how they judged you. You could, you could enact trial by river. It was almost like you're judge. So hopefully you know how to swim. So that was kind of like a, is that, does that kind of seem normal for like today? No, right? But that, I mean, could you see where that could maybe seem normal for them? Where would they think of more of a supernatural lifestyle, more of a, um, they have, we'll get into uh, the, their gods demand certain things. So we'll get more into that later. What was the other one? 23. Oh, also, somebody read number eight. Just don't, I mean, who wants to read number eight? It's kind of interesting. Okay, go ahead. If anyone steals cattle or sheep or eggs or pig or goat, if it belongs to a god or to the poor and needy, you shall pay thirty fold therefore. If they belong to a free man or king, you shall pay ten fold therefore. If the thief has nothing with 
if which decay you shall be put to death. So what's this, uh, doesn't it kind of seem weird that they want to just put people to death for everything? What do you think that does? If you just know that if you commit a crime, you just, you might have a chance of dying. What does that, what does that, what does that make you will not want to do? Okay. Commit the crime, right? So if you were like, if it was like, oh, if I go steal this guy's goat, but I have no way to pay him back, whatever that ghost cost is, but I have to give him back the goat also. So you have to give him back the price of the goat and the goat itself, right? And if I can't, well, that's, that's my head. So that, doesn't that seem kind of that, that, like, if you were in this society, you wouldn't want to commit crimes, right? Now, this society is a little bit different because um, the crimes and your punishment dealt, and we could read this all day and dive really deep into it, but it deals with your rank in society. So if you were a king, the laws of um, a king or a priest, the laws um, kind of were a little bit different for you. If you were a merchant of somebody of higher class, like a common folk, it was also just as different. And then if you were a slave, different rules applied differently for you. Um, sometimes if, um, if something happens, so like, uh, let's say if, I, if a noble accidentally cut the ear off of um, a common person. Well, that, that, the idea of eye for an eye is a big thing in uh, Habavi's code, but they, he would give the cost of the ear, not an actual ear. He wouldn't have to cut his ear off. So it depends on your social class, if that makes sense. All right, I'm gonna go to 23. So these are like this is weird, right? Like this is not this is not what we would think of socially normal. They just kill people for stealing, right? Uh, who wants to read number 23 for me? It's kind of an interesting idea. If robber is not caught, then shall he who has robbed claim under oath the amount of his loss, then shall the city stand on his ground and territory and give the city compensated to Okay, so what, what, doesn't this seem kind of weird? So if somebody gets robbed, right, it's up to the community to help pay for his loss, right? So what does that kind of seem like? What is that like? It's like, huh? Isn't it like a couple rules or what? Well, I wouldn't say that. You're getting there. Um, you're getting to an idea. Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of like, um, it, that's, a, that's a good way to put it. Um, it's almost like a social safety net. Um, think of it as more like a ancient insurance, right? Your community is your insurance. They, they, keep, they keep track of you, they protect you, um, stuff like that. So they're there to help you. And so that, that kind of, what else does that prevent? Does that prevent the community from stealing from each other, right? Because if I, have, if I steal from him, but the community has to pay for it anyways, that kind of just defeats the purpose, right? Because if they're very communal groups, because city states are small, um, uh, not small, but they're community groups. There's also uh, different villages outside. So if you see that your community, the, these, uh, these societies are set up on a hierarchy, which uh, the hierarchy is like, uh, they have like a chieftain or which is like the top of their community, which um, answers to the priests and the kings. So you can kind of see this hierarchy that kind of goes up. 32. Uh, this one's kind of weird. Um, it's kind of long, but who wants to read 32 for me? Or I can read it. Unless the else wants to read it. Who wants to read it? Anybody? It's long. All right, I'll read it then. So if a chieftain or a man is captured in the way of the king, so the way of the king is like his orders for war. So if like I'm a, I'm a soldier and I'm going out for war, all right? Uh, a merchant can buy his freedom. So let's say Jackson wants to buy my freedom, right? He, he wants to come, he, you know, he's going to be like, hey, I got you. I got your freedom. So now we're going to keep going in uh, and brings him back to his place. So he brings me back home. Um, if he has the means to pay for his freedom, then I can pay for my freedom. So if I have the money at my house or the goods or the bartering equivalent of my freedom, I can pay him back. All right. Um, if not, he shall buy himself free. If, I, if nothing in this house could buy himself freedom, he shall be bought by the temple of his community. So we get back to this community group. Since he was based off of the king's orders, the community is wholly responsible for buying back his freedom. Um, if they do not have the money, uh, the court shall free him. So the king's court, or which is the, the governing body of the land or the peacekeepers also, um, they can buy your land, but, I mean, buy his freedom, but his fields, gardens, and house shall never be taken from him. So they can't take your property, 
if like um let's say they're like oh but um you're the merchant jackson's like well give me your give me that piece of land over there they're not he's not allowed to that's not what that's not in the agreement within this code system okay 110 I right, who wants to read that? It's pretty short. One ten. If a sister of God open a tavern or enter a tavern to drink, then shall the king be friend. <laughs> pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Pretty crazy, right? What do you guys think a sister of God means? Like a nun, right? Or like um, or it's like a priestess or something like that, right? So don't you? They're they're held held to a certain standard. They can't open taverns. They can't sell alcohol. Don't you, don't you think it's kind of weird that for drinking a single, like drinking of like a beer or like something like that, some type of alcoholic beverage, they get burned to death? Kind of seems like Salem witch trials, right? Kind of a little weird, right? So, I mean, you kind of see like this, this weird, like, com, like not really this idea that laws change, things that are socially acceptable change throughout history. They have their ups and they have their downs. History and law kind of go hand in hand. They kind of do a progression system. And also degression. It's kind of an up and down thing. All right. 116. Is this one I like? No, I didn't like that one. It's 117. Okay, uh, so I'm going to read 117. It's pretty crazy. If a prisoner dies in prison and blows from the tree. No, 17. Oh. If anyone fails to meet a claim for death and sells himself to his wife, his son, and his daughter for money, or gives them away for forced labor, they shall work for three years in the house of the man who bought them, or in the public house of the poor, and the man may afford to be in his house. So what's weird about this law? You sell, you, sell well, you, sell, you sell yourself and your family, right? How do you usually pay off debt? A payment plan, right? So, you know, usually you have like an installment, like you pay a certain amount each month, right? Yeah, they didn't do that back then. If you couldn't pay it, um, you could also... You had every legal right to sell your whole family into slavery. That's crazy, right? Like, that's, that's nuts. If, if you were just like, ah, you know what? I got to pay my debts off. But my son's, been, I've been, my son's been, like, really making me mad lately. I'll just sell him to slavery and make some money. They also, they also could do this on a whim. They didn't have to, it didn't have to be by debt. You could just sell a family member off. Um, yeah, usually you didn't uh, – usually your wife – yeah. That's a little crazy, right? That's like that, that culturally is not acceptable. But back then, it's very normal. It's a very normal happenstance. Um, usually, they didn't sell their wives because there was another, there's more of a legal thing that goes into selling your wife. It's a lot more complicated in this society. Um, we'll kind of get, we'll get a little bit into that. It's, it's crazy, though. So, 129. Is this the one I wanted to do? So, like you're saying they would sell it to the person that they hooked up to? Yeah. You could give that person, and they uh, they would do manual labor in a field, in a house, something like that, to pay off their debt for three years. So it has a limited time. So then, in four years, you get back. Yeah. So let's say um, let's say Jackson's my son, right? And I'm like, you know what, Jackson, I gotta pay off some debt. I'll see you in three years. I I could just go sell him. Like it's not it's not that big of a deal. Also, uh, if a child uh, stri strikes their father, that child can be put to death, also, or sold into slavery. It's very weird, right? So there's like these really complex, like kind of weird. All right. <laughs> the thing about a lot of those is that it's kind of a social part of that. You, you go into uh, Chinese, the Japanese culture, things like that, respecting your elders, always having the circle of life for the father to the son, to the son, to the father, and then like that one, you know, it didn't matter what happened, the dad had the authority. It was over that one. The other thing is when you're talking about, you know, like sending somebody off for four years, that same idea got introduced to the United States whenever it was a different servitude, whenever it was slavery, and all of these things just keep going and going and going. Um, so, you know, that, that's a common way of life, and people just build off of that common way of life, you know, until slavery, same thing, until 1865, we finally start saying that and this is not right. You know what I mean? So it goes a long way uh, in the history of man. So, does anybody want to read uh, 142? It's very interesting. It's it's kind of divorce law is the best way to put it. Okay, go ahead. 42? Uh, 142, yes. Okay. If a woman quarrels, quarrels. Yeah, with her husband and say, you're not congenial to me as a reason, 
for her prejudice must be prevented. If she is guiltless and there is no fault on her part, but she leaves it and neglects her, then no guilt attaches to this woman. She shall take her dowry and go back to her father's house. Okay. Does anybody know what a dowry is? Can anybody tell me what a dowry is? What? <laughs> no, go ahead and say that loud. <laughs> like her bags. Okay, her bags. Oh, uh, not, no. Like not belongings. not necessarily. Her belongings. Okay, that's good. You're on the right track. You're on her belongings. So, um, can, so back then, they still do this now. Um, if I wanted to marry somebody, right, I'd have, my father would have to pay their father to marry that person. So I'm basically buying their daughter from them. It's like the best, it's like a, it's an exchange of goods. We're not talking like cash or like gold, Man, maybe gold and like tin and stuff. Um, but this time period have been like tin and bronze were pretty like expensive, but we're talking like you could, these people would trade like goats and sheep and cows. What if you're not like that person? It doesn't matter. It's it's an arranged it's a, it's an arranged marriage. That's not I mean that's just how it that's just not how it worked. Love wasn't I mean love was a thing back then, but it wasn't as important for family units. Um, mostly um, it was like an arranged marriage. You guys know what an arranged marriage is, right? So we still have those today, right? In certain cultures. Now it's not as prevalent. It's not as uh, something that happens that often. So that is something that's weird, right? But this kind of gives you a divorce law also. So if if you're not treating your wife correctly and she brings up to a court or brings up to the community, she can now take the money or the goods that her father gave, right? And then now she goes back. So the father pays me to marry her, his daughter. Well, his daughter doesn't like me anymore, right? And so she takes that money or goods or whatever back and goes right back to her father. And so that's kind of how they could get around um, like being abused, stuff like that. I'm gonna do one more, 148. Okay, 148. Let's read it. It's also pretty interesting. Kind of deals with lifestyle. Like, nobody? Nobody? I'm not calling somebody. Tristan, you go ahead. You want to read that for me? Can you not read that from that far? Hmm, who's close to? Who do I want to read? I'll just read it. It's fine. <laughs> it's kind of long. I don't feel like if a woman, okay, if, if a man takes a wife and she's, uh, she be seized by disease, this is very hard to read. I know if he then desires to take a second wife, so he can take a second wife because his wife is sick. All right. Yeah, where did it go? Uh, desires to take a second wife. He shall not put away his wife. So he can't kick his wife out because she's sick. All right. Um, who has been attacked by disease, but he shall keep her in the house, which he has built and support her for as long as she lives. So because it is his wife, even though she's sick and he's taken on another wife, he's still obligated to his first wife. And if she recovers, she now becomes the head wife. It's really weird. There's like a hierarchy of wives and mistresses and stuff like that. It, it's based on bearing children is the best way to put it. There's another one in here that says, um, if if your wife doesn't bear a child, you could basically divorce her and get another wife that bears a child for you. It's very weird. It's kind of a it's a weird social concept, right? We don't we don't think that is normal nowadays. But back then, completely normal. It's just the way they did things. All right, so we're gonna get to the notes so we can get through this. I hope I didn't take up so much time talking. I just find this stuff interesting. Uh, you got to 49. 49? Oh, we got time. Perfect. You guys want to go to the PowerPoint or you can just listen to me. I mean, some of the stuff we've already gone over, so it's kind of review, but it kind of gives you uh, – so we're going into – we're going back into the uh, early river valley civilization. I don't really like the number 450 BC, but that's what they want you to know, so that doesn't really matter. Um. Can anybody tell me where the Indus River Valley is? Any ideas? Think of the first letter in there and then think of a, a subcontinent. India, right? Oh, close, India. India is where the Indus, Indus, India, that's where India kind of gets its name. Anyways, 
So today we're going to talk about the city-states of uh, Mesopotamia. So Mesopotamia is like the Egyptians are one of the oldest civilizations ever. There's, um, so it's, we'll get into it kind of a, so um, if you guys didn't know, the Middle East is still part of Asia. I don't know if you guys knew that. You guys know that? Yeah, the Middle East is still considered Asia. It's Asia Minor. That area is, called, is Asia still. All right, uh, do you guys remember what the Fertile Crescent is? Who can tell me the, the areas of the Fertile Crescent? We talked about this last week. Deals with some rivers. Tigris. Tigris. What else? What's the other rivers? Euphrates. And what was the last one? The other one? The Nile. The Nile. So that, that area that kind of does this, right? Kind of does this. That's considered the Fertile Crescent. Um, it's, mostly considered, it's mostly considered in the Tigris and Euphrates, but it's, some historians put it in the Nile River also. Um, so Mesopotamia basically means land between the rivers. Pretty simple, right? It's two rivers. There's land between it. Mesopotamia. It's a fertile plain. Um, so we talked about how um, the Euphrates would flood once a year and leave rich soil. We already talked about that. Flooding creates fertility, stuff like that. All right. So around 3300 BC, Sumerians began to farm southern Mesopotamia. So we're talking like towards the Persian Gulf, kind of the southern part of um, East, um, that, that region. Uh, as we said last week uh, with the uh, religion, their, uh, their floods are very unpredictable. So sometimes it wouldn't even rain. So there could, there could be droughts. Um, they could have weird um, flood patterns. Um, so there's, no, uh, there's also no barrier besides the rivers for invasion. What, you, what is most of the Middle East? It's flat, right? Flat desert. Some of it's a little bit watery. Do you think that's very adjuntavis for defense? How so? Okay, there's not really, they didn't really have snipers or like mortars back then. I mean, they had like bows, maybe some spears, but as in like, if you're trying to, if you're trying to defend a position, you want like, you want natural borders, right? There's no natural barricades or anything like that. It's just flat ground. Um, so it has very few natural resources. The desert doesn't have that much, right? You think the desert has a bunch of trees everywhere? Not really, right? So they had a, what, how, how do you think they got wood then? Trading. trading. So, and that came from what? Their surplus of food. So they could trade food and other goods to get these raw materials that they needed for construction and stuff like that. Their boats and stuff. So pro solving problems through organizations. So how do they do that? How do you think they, what is one way that you solve problems? Can somebody tell me? But how do you solve problems? The group of people. Solutions, solutions right? How do you how do you convey those solutions? Easy. Talking, language, writing, right? So these are some things that that's how organization evolved. So they could actually fight these environmental challenges. So they build irrigation. What's irrigation for? Watering crops. Watering crops, right? So you know, you, there's a period where there's unpredictable floods. At least you have irrigation that can maybe get you water. But, um, so walled cities, what do you think they built their, uh, their walls out of? Okay, mud. That's good. So it, like, think of it like this. You, um, you, know, you ever make mud pies before? Yeah. Think of mud pies. They were basically just stacking mud pies on top of each other until they solidified. They would be pretty hard, like what we think of modern bricks. They would be pretty dense, pretty hard. Um, they filled them with different things because um, a lot of it was like clay, sand, and water, so it got pretty hard. Um, so they traded grain, cloth, and tools for raw materials like stone and wood, because there wasn't that much stone and wood in there. It was mostly just desert. You can get sandstone, but you know you, that takes a while. Um, so we have this idea of uh, also metal. So um, in modern day Turkey, which would be the northern area, it was a. What do you? How do you make bronze? We talked about this last week. And tin, right? So copper and tin. Tin's very rare um, in the ancient time. It was very hard to get. So it, it was very costly. They'd get it from the mountains and they'd caravan it down. So there was a, a network of trade that was created just for copper and tin. Um, so we see the first organization and leadership and laws, like we talked about earlier, these different law codes that are developed. Hobo Abbey is just one of the only ones that we have record of. There's probably thousands of different law codes that we never have record of because they didn't write it down or they were destroyed throughout history. So Sumerian city-states. So can anybody tell me what a city-state is or can name a city-state in the net uh, right now? Um, 
Starts with an S. That is a city state. You're not wrong. I'm talking about modern city states. Yeah, like today, like a modern city state. Starts with an S. No, that's a country. Getting close though. It's in Southeast Asia. Anybody? <laughs> close. Singapore. So Singapore. As you guys, I don't know if you guys know what Singapore is, but it's literally just a big city, right? So a city-state, the basic idea of a city-state is it's a city or like a town or something, and they control the area around them. It's not like a country like we think of or like a state like we think of Texas with multiple cities. It's just one city-state that controls the – it's like having a city limit, right? You have city limits, right? That is your city-state limit. Think of it like that. So Fort Worth and Dallas, so they're both – um, their own city state. Think of it like that. They each have their own city, uh, city lines. That, that's their marked territory. Um, there's Uruk, Kish, uh, Lagash, Uma, and Ur. Ur is one of those popular ones. We talked about Ur last week. Um, each of these places had a temple and a ziggurat, like we talked about last week. They're, you know, city centers, stuff like that. Not going that much into it. Um, so early government, um, somebody, I forgot what class and who said it, was uh, said of theocracy. I don't know who said that. It was you. So they, they had a rough system of theocracy. So for, at first, your temple priests were the head government officials. But as military leaders started to arise, people started um, like making armies. You to see this idea of dynasties. Can anybody name a dynasty? The Mongolian dynasty. Good. What else? Well, there's um, there's different kingdoms, right? You can if you look at the uh, Queen of England, she's part of a dynasty, right? So these, you know, it's a ruling class of family. It's a single family that has a ruling class. So that's the way to put it. There's multiple dynasties. As this is one of the first dynasties, but dynasties will you'll see more and more as we go through history. All right, spread of cities. So if you have a large amount of food, right, in different areas. Can you have more people, right? So as you have more people, what what grows? What grows out of more people? Population. Population. And that grows more trading, which creates diversity. diversity and city centers. So you have these big diverse groups, big cities being developed. What is cultural diffusion? Who can tell me what diffusion means? Mixing cultures, good. So I gave this uh, I gave this example last class. It's not the greatest example. But let's say that Stephenville never has had Mexican food ever. They've never had it, you know. And all of a sudden, this one store restaurant comes in and starts selling Mexican food. Everybody loves it. So now it spreads throughout this, the town, and there's a lot of Mexican uh, food places. So that's what cultural diffusion is in the simplest form. It is diffusion of culture um, across other cultures. So it's like the mixing of it. It's like a mixing pot. Uh, the last year they played in America, I'm like, not, this doesn't relate to this, but like last yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that, it's a similar idea. Yeah. They start their own business. It creates a cultural phenomenon. Because do you think we were eating tacos 100 years ago? Probably not. Um, so it kind of this, anyways. Uh, so Sumerians believe in uh, many different gods. It's polytheism. What is polytheism? What does poly mean? Multiple gods. Multiple gods. Okay. What does mono mean? One. Okay. So they had like a very... They had a very, um, like a pantheon, kind of like how the Greek gods and the Roman gods, they had multiple gods that mean different things, that, are, that, are, that have different powers, different forces. They do different things. They control different things. Um, they also were, they behaved like humans. So they had human, humanistic behaviors, wants, lust, needs, stuff like that. Um, uh, but they weren't, they weren't servants. The, the people are the gods' servants. They... They, it was like an iron fist type of thing. Um, life after death is bleak and gloomy. So they didn't have like a paradise or anything like that. They didn't have, they, the, um, I don't know if anybody, if y'all are Catholic, but it'd be kind of like purgatory is like the best way to explain what life and death, uh, their life and death is. So uh, life in uh, Sumerian society. Uh, so they had a social classes, like we said, because uh, allocation of wealth creates social classes and also divinity. Else, so you had your kings and your landholders, uh, your priest at top, 
then you had your merchants, so like your street merchants, people that sold things. Uh, it's not on there, but in the middle would be like your common folk, your farmers, stuff like that. And at the bottom was slaves. Um, in this society, they had slaves, so they would, uh, of course, be at the bottom. Uh, but in this society, women had many rights. Uh, they can become priests and priestesses. They can be merchants, so they can make their own businesses. And they can be craftsmen or artisans. They can make things. So they had a lot more autonomy in their own society. They could, um, they could actually own land. Um, there was kind of like a rough way they did it, but they could own land. They could own a business. They could make money. So, it was, it, but they still have they still had strict laws again. So Sumerian science and technology. What do you think so important about a wheel? You know, we think it's kind of simple, but what's kind of important about that? A water wheel, good. So you could um, increase production, maybe get water to um, irrigation. Yeah. Okay, what else? What else does a wheel help you do? Transport makes it a lot easier, right? You think it's easier to drag something or put it on a cart? There's a reason why we have carts, right? It makes it a lot easier. Yeah, steering wheel, stuff like that. Yeah, we, it made it easier to transport goods, transport people, maybe get around a little bit easier. Um, we see um, chariots. I don't know. Do you guys know what chariots are? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something that a horse would pull, have wheels, and you'd shoot off of it or, like, throw spears and stuff. It's, like, for war. Um, what about a sail? Well, they're on rivers, right? So what's so important about a sail? Yeah, you can sail up and down the, um, the rivers. What about a plow? What does a plow do? Yeah, so you like, you know, it makes it a lot easier to plant food, which makes it more efficient. So now you have more food, right? So you have more trade, yada, yada. Uh, and they used, they were the first ones to use bronze. So you see this uh, bronze technique started using. Arithmetic and geometry. What's important about arithmetic? Okay, arithmetic is just a, a, a very, like, it's just math. It's like counting and stuff like that. What's important? What do you have to keep? So like stockpiles. Yeah, you have to keep record. How many, how many things we have? You have to count. Uh, geometry. What does geometry help you do? Build. Yes. So it helps you build structures. And you know the structural integrity and these different angles and stuff like that. Um, what do you think is in, uh, so we have columns, arch. So that develops arches, columns, ramps, pyramids for building. So they have their own pyramid. We already talked about that. You have cuneiform. We talked about cuneiform, a system of writing to keep record. That's how we know so much about this because they kept a record of it. It's so important to keep record of things. What's so important about astronomy? What's astronomy? Spiritual way, good. What else was astronomy used for? Navigation. navigation. So it's important for navigation, for, like for trade routes and stuff like that. What about chemistry? What did chemistry give you? Okay, bronze. What else? Potions, like ideas of potions, maybe maybe herbs, maybe natural medicines, right? Um, chemistry, that maybe maybe a simple form of fertilizer or pest control. Uh, what about medicine? What's so important about medicine? Keeps you healthy, right? What else is going on right now? You think they're fighting each other right now? You think they're you, you think they want what other people have? So you have conflict, you have war, you have disease. Medicine helps with that type of stuff. We have the development of medicine in a more conflict. So time of war. The city states were in constant state of war. Why do you think that is? So yeah, they didn't like each other. They wanted to, they wanted to expel their influence on other places. They wanted to make the, known that they are the most powerful city state in the area or their God is the patron God or the, the king of all gods for them. So they would go and conquest take trade routes, take resources, yada, yada. But what was for? Sargon of Acadia, um, around 2350 BC, Sargon from Acadia defeats city-state of Sumer. Sumer's a very um, important city-state from Mesopotamia. We know a lot about it. Um, created the first empire. What's, what's so important about an empire? What is an empire? It's a lot of land. Mm -hmm. control. Controlled by one person, right? All right, so that's kind of interesting when you have all these independent city-states, but they are now under control by one city-state. So they become, I don't know you guys know what vassals are. No, vassal basically, what a vassal is, is somebody that pays tribute or like a, a certain amount of goods and services, like they pay a tax basically um, to the king. They also 
uh, to the emperor. They also bring men to fight for the emperor, stuff like that. Uh, the, his dynasty lasted 200 years, which is a long time for an ancient dynasty. Um, later on, we'll see dynasties don't last that long. It, Egypt's a little bit of an exception, but in general, dynasties and stuff like that, one family ruling forever does not last that long. Uh, the Babylonian, I don't, the, the, you guys all know about the Babylonians. Tower of Babel, stuff like that, right? So this is where we get Hammurabi's code, code his rules. It's an actual civilization. Um, it's like in the middle. It's, in, it's between two rivers. It's actually between them. Um, this, um, this, uh, this empire was made of Armorites, which is like a, it was like a, a cultural group. It was, um, nomadic warriors uh, took control of the, um, their area. So this was the Armonite, uh, Armonites, I believe how you say that. They make Babylon's betray, uh, river. It becomes like the unofficial capital of uh, Mesopotamia. And um, so it peaks. So look, how long, how long did that um, rule last? Like what, 40 years? Yeah, so that's not long, right? Consider 200 to 40 years. That's, you'll see a trend on that. So we talked about these codes a little bit. Uh, this is for the Babylonian Empire. It's 282. It's a lot of, I haven't read them all, but they're kind of interesting, so I might. Um, different, uh, based on social classes, talked about that, gender, uh, goal of the government is to take responsibility for order and justice. Um, the fertile crescent ended for 200 years after. So this, his dynasty, Habarabi's dynasty ended, but the Amorites rule extended for another 200 years. And that's it. So you guys do have a quiz. You guys can go ahead and take it. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. You have about nine, what, nine minutes? Yeah, nine minutes. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, it should just be chapter two, section one.